Why is your robo taxi going to be different? Well, I guess it's the integration of, you know, our uh, leading EV technology, the luxury experience that the Lucid Gravity provides with the Neuro driver, uh, you know, and bringing this to market very, very, very fast. Because, I mean, from when we all came together, the three of us, and uh, to when we plan to roll it out by the end of the year in a, in a paid service, actually, it's less than 18 months. Yeah. And if you do that in that short period of time, that's actually a very unique thing by, by itself. But the product excel, uh, itself, you, you, we are now unveiled the production intent design. It's much more integrated, less, you know, a lot of different things on the edges of the vehicle, more integrated. And uh, so it's going to be a very, very good experience for the customer. Will it always take that form, the relationship of Neuro, Uber and yourself? Because we've just had Jensen unveiling his own self-driving platform. Right. Would that be integrated? Would you be an OEM that uses that more directly for the consumer? In, in, in fact, we announced a couple of uh, months ago in a partnership with NVIDIA on exactly that topic. So we are also using NVIDIA Drive for our gravity, but for our uh, B2C customers. So the same thing that was basically announced yesterday with Mercedes, we will also have by the end of this year in our Lucid Gravity. And when we come with our mid-size platform, also at the end of this year, we'll have this from the start. And that, but we don't stop there. We will actually, next step is L3, where you actually have mind off uh, on the highway. And then that will, is planned for 2028. And then L4, we're planning together with NVIDIA by 2029 for our B2C customers. So it's, it's different. <clears throat> it's a different path than on rev robo taxis. But we will also continue to uh, evolve our robo taxi ambitions. Will the regulation be there by 2029? Is that what you're banking on? But that's what we're banking on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And more broadly, how do you see, therefore, the ecosystem evolving? What in 2029 will I own? You mean a, a car? There's or? robo taxis that are already on offering. If yeah. I can choose between Waymo, I can use between Uber, I can yeah. get in your car in that respect. Yeah. Do I need to therefore really own my own Lucid you, car? You will. You will. I think. I don't think that we get to, to a point where there will be only robo taxis because use cases, for instance, in inner cities, you know, or short runs, make sense with robo taxis. But you also want to be able to you know make it your your own vehicle you don't want to go into something where somebody else was just sitting in or let's say if you have a family you have more than one kid you need a, you know a, a child seat you want to lock this around and put it into a robo taxi and then take it out again i mean you, it's not feasible it's not it's not feasible but anyway there will always be both yeah and but i think what is very very important is on the not only on the robo taxi side but also on the uh, the the uh, retail customer side, uh, you want to choose. Do I want to be driven or do I want to drive myself? In particular, our cars are known how great they drive. Yeah? And that, actually, that's a very important thing because, I mean, EVs very often are, you know, kind of like stigmatized with, oh, that's the sustainable choice and it's, it's expensive and it all needs incentives. That is not true. Our cars, for instance, they drive fantastic. Yeah? They, they actually have better performance than internal combustion engines if you compare them in their, in their real, uh, in their real compar competitive set. So I think this will go away over time that you have that con the conversation between internal combustion engines and EVs, and EVs will, will win in the end. Well, let's talk about where Lucid is at this moment, because yeah. last year it was a painful year in terms of stock performance. Yes. You were having to cut downgrade how many cars you were going to be able to produce, but then suddenly you ramped at the end of the year. You've yeah. delivered significant production yeah. in Q4. How does that scale? Yeah. So, I mean, I have to say I'm very proud of what the team pulled off. I mean, we had, and I was very vocal about this, we had issues with ramping up um, our gravity, our uh, first SUV. And that was supply chain. Magnus it was, it was supply chain, several su supply chain issues. I mean, whole 2025 was full of, you know, surprises. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Not only for us, also for, uh, for the whole industry. But then we still delivered in Q4 our eighth consecutive uh, record quarter on deliveries as well. You know, that means the last two years, every single quarter, we increased our deliveries. And when it comes to production, we increased the production for, for the whole year by more than 100%. And just in the, <clears throat> in the last quarter, from Q3 to Q4, even that by more than 100%. So we're really now ramping up and we, we solved the supply chain issues. Completely. So 2026 will not be a supply chain headache issue. Not that I what I know of. I mean, last year, if you would have 
Yeah. They asked me the same question in January. I would say the same thing. And then uh, a couple of things happened. Yeah. What happened was a trade war and tariffs. Right. How have you changed your supply chain with Asia in particular? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is still a process yeah? because you cannot do this from one day to the other. If you have, um, we're building actually, by the way, all of our vehicles right now are built in the United States. But still, we have components coming from other parts of the world. Yeah? And we are in process to localize this in order to not have to, to pay the, the tariffs. Uh, as an example, one very big element of our of our uh, bill of material is the batteries. Yeah? And right now they come either from Korea or a bigger chunk actually from Japan. And uh, we will localize this to the United States mid of this year. So that will actually help already quite a bit. But there's still more work to do. So we are we're making those decisions as as we go in order to bring more things stateside in order to save them. Where is Lucid space in terms of global market share? We've just heard that BYD has become the number one EV yeah. producer in the world, eclipsing Tesla. Tesla still has significant chunk of share. Yeah. We've seen Xiaomi grow in yeah. China as well. Where do you fit? Well, here's the thing. When, when these days, when people talk about EVs, they mix everybody up, meaning BYD, uh, Tesla, and, and, and Xiaomi, or anything else, yeah? and, Hybrids, us, yeah. and, 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 and us. We are a luxury manufacturer right now. We're not playing the same price point as right now. For we don't have yet. We will, but we don't have yet the the fifty thousand dollar or even less offer we want to. Yes, that that uh, Tesla has. The Chinese are actually further down. When you look in in uh, the Chinese market, I mean, you cannot make money uh, there. And we have, uh, by the way, no plans to go to China because I don't think there's there's any any way to make uh, to make a profit uh, there for a Western OEM coming in. But we think in our luxury space, what we offer, luxury and I would also say premium, because we will go down to, uh, to the premium sector around about $50,000. That's what we will do. Yes, absolutely. But we have no plans to go down to, I don't know, thirty, twenty thousand uh, dollars $20,000. And that's where the bulk of the, uh, the sales of the Chinese are right now. When you look at the, the level higher, then um, it's not that great.